Welcome my loves, it's your hair on a Tuesday and on Tuesdays we do deep dives into the environmental, social or ethical issues with the world and I've kind of been doing this series about tragic icons which I really do want to continue. As you can see we're talking about the classic Judy Garland today. This has been requested from one of my other videos that I did and I'm going to be carrying on adding to this series. If you have other starlets that you want me to cover please do let me know in the description box down below. Now this is not going to be a complete biography of her whole life because there's literally websites where you can get like every single thing that she's ever done in her life. No, 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 no. I'm interested and the person, the complexities of them, and if anything, Judy Garland is absolutely one of those key people that we keep on referring back to in life because she's become this wonderful icon who I believe is one of the most witty, charismatic, warm, engaging people that has ever graced this planet. This video is not meant to impart pity on her because she never really wanted that. This is actually a point of admiration for her and the achievements that she's made in her life as well as like going into the deep dark stuff. Now I do want to have a trigger warning because if you know anything about Judy Garland's life you'll probably already know the darkness that actually was already there. Eating disorders, drug addiction, suicide, forced abortion um, and abuse. So um, please refer to last week's video for something a little bit lighter which I'll just link right up there. Um, so if you can't handle that I fully understand your mental health is way more important. All of my sources are in the description box down below. We're creating this look which is kind of like an amalgamation of the look that she had for the Wizard of Oz and also the looks that she wore later on because she actually smudged her liner a lot more. She went into this really sultry sort of look so I've kind of combined both of them. So anyway it's all cruelty free, vegan and not owned by parent companies that test on animals and that's all listed down below too. Without any further ado let's jump straight on into it. She's exactly where my chair needs to be so let's see how this goes. Let's get started down this yellow brick road to um, unusual and strange places. The beginnings of which are quite bleak I have to say. Let's get started on Judy Garland's childhood. Judy's childhood wasn't exactly what we would refer to as being idyllic or you know, a childhood that would be wishing on anyone really. So when Judy's mother actually found out that she was pregnant, they were quite horrified because they genuinely couldn't afford to have another child. They tried to actually have an abortion for Judy because like this was their third girl. And they were just barely making ends meet. And so they went to their doctor and they were like, can we please get an abortion? And obviously this was illegal so it was typically done with like a rusty knife and it was a very dangerous procedure to happen and also, like I said, very illegal. And so the doctor said no, and so what they did is they tried to actually create a miscarriage themselves. So they drove really, really quickly down some like terrible bumpy roads in order to try and induce a miscarriage, but you know, Judy just held on. I think it would have been absolutely terrifying to be Ethel and Frances, like her parents at the time, because can you imagine like genuinely not knowing how you're going to feed your kids? This was in like, what, 1922 is when Judy was born? There wasn't very much in the way of like aid for people that needed genuine help. And so you'll probably know that her parents were vaudeville actors, well at least her mother definitely was, as were her two older sisters. And Judy actually got put on stage when she was only two and a half years old. <laughs> and like I said before, we can speculate all that we want, but at the same time it's like, the kids had to work. They had no money, so it's like, what else were they going to do? So there was Judy just going on stage from the age of two and a half with her sisters and her mother. Her father didn't actually um, do anything with it, but they went on tours and they did all sorts of stuff around this time. Watch her interviews telling stories about the vaudeville days it's like wow what a time the fire breather vomiter um there's a lot of stories and she tells them all so well as you all probably know if you're watching this and you're here to critique what i do and do not know about judy garland um judy is obviously not her real name um, like many starlets of the time, but luckily she actually got to choose her name. She heard a song and the name Judy was mentioned and that was how she actually picked her name. Obviously the kids carried on entertaining and at the age of like 9 or 10 is when amphetamines started to get given to the children by their mother, Ethel. Because you know, you have to give them something to keep them going on stage and it's like... Anybody else getting flashes to poor um, Honey Boo Boo's like go-go juice? Like... Now granted amphetamines are worse. We all know, sadly, that the human brain keeps developing until you're 25 and so this was happening to Judy when she was 9 or 10 years old and this is sadly the start of her pill addiction. Like I've already talked about in my Priscilla video, like, it's just getting prescribed pills was just a thing, sadly. So you can honestly only imagine what the amphetamines, barbiturates, sleeping pills, like all of that stuff was actually doing to a child's developing brain. She still had 15 more years of development just for her brain to keep going. And then you combine that with the fact that like 
Her mother didn't actually want her and made it quite apparent, <laughs> even though she was like the apple of her mother's eye, but only in a way of like earning money. And she would intimidate her, she would force her to do performances, uh, whether it was through intimidation or actual um, abuse. In many interviews, uh, Judy's actually been referring to her mother as like the real wicked witch of the West. I really, really do feel for her and it's like, so from the age of two and a half, you are performing on stage, getting wonderful applause, getting all this sort of wonderful positive attention and the only positive attention that you receive from your parents is when you're performing. It's like naturally your brain is going to associate like performance as being like the way that you get the attention that you need. Your, your only avenue of getting positive attention and you'll get negative attention if you don't do it. So I fully understand how she's gotten this absolutely massive body of work that we all get to enjoy now. But I'm like, far out. <laughs> Honestly, it's a wonder that she made it as far in life as she did, given everything that she went through. Now also, she signed up to MGM when she was only 13 years old, and they really did struggle with what to put her in, obviously, because it's like, she can't exactly play like a cute little cherub like Shirley Temple, but also she's not womanly enough to play like harlot or whatever. Uh, so she got cast often as like the girl next door sort of type. And she started working with Mickey Rooney, who like she knew from like school and stuff. And so th that sort of stuff was positive. However, MGM, I could do an entire video all about MGM because did you also know that Jeff Bezos owns them now? <laughs> and he openly said that the only reason that he did it was for the IP. So anytime the you or I really want to watch like Judy Garland movies, we have to benefit Jeff Bezos. And I hate that fact. I know there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, but why him? And in case you didn't know, the 12 year old that she was playing, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, she was actually 17 at the time. And they did all sorts of things to try and make her body look a lot uh, younger. <laughs> she kept on getting referred to as a hunchback, all sorts of terrible stuff from MGM. So let's actually talk about the lack of body autonomy and the prescription peril that poor Judy actually went through. For Judy's entire life, people were telling her that she wasn't good enough, she wasn't pretty enough, she wasn't sexy enough, she wasn't young enough, she wasn't old enough, she wasn't skinny enough. Like she just never fit into the exact box that Hollywood wanted her to. As you know, MGM's a bit of a scummy company. So MGM actually prescribed her amphetamines on top of what she was already taking because she was still taking them but like she hadn't told them because like they were just prescription it was it was just normal totally normal to take amphetamines every day now look they honestly did not know that she was taking amphetamines at the time and so like i can kind of try and cut them some slack but i'm also like why the hell were you giving a teenager amphetamines? Not only like singing, dancing, acting, like all of that stuff, there was a particular standard of beauty and they kind of styled everyone the same sort of way. And then of course in the 50s it became, are you a Jackie or are you a Marilyn and all this other stuff. But typically for like the 1920s, 1930s, there was this very like sultry, beautiful, um, almost like goddess-like look that every single woman had to have, like this very ethereal, all American beauty sort of standard. And Judy is actually really, really beautiful, but not in like a very typical way in terms of like cookie cutter. Like her face has some quirks. So because Judy never actually quite fit into like the right mold and was a difficult woman, um, because being difficult uh, is basically just saying that, hey, um, I don't want to just be constantly cast as this girl next door character. I actually want to challenge myself and I am going to be opinionated about stuff. Oh my God, how the hell dare you? This is a 1920s woman. Get back in the kitchen. Whack. I'm trying to make jokes out of this because it's actually horrific and absurd to me. So I'm just trying to make it a bit lighter, okay? Because this topic makes me really, really sad what she went through. If you've seen anything with interviewing her, you can definitely tell she's a very ambitious woman. She wasn't allowed to get married when she wanted. She wasn't allowed to have babies when she wanted. Like, like what sadly did actually happen to other starlets. Like, she was forced to have um, abortions. But you know, it was it was referred to as like appendicitis, all this other stuff. Um, so that's what she had to go through even after her first marriage. She got married and she desperately wanted to have the baby. <sighs> but of course, that was a no. She was beaten down by the producers, by her partners, by the public sometimes even. And of course, the press most infamously like the thing is that there's so much misinformation about Judy because the press really wanted to like rile up all sorts of emotions around her because they knew that it would get 
not clicks, but like newspapers sold back then. And it was incredibly disgusting the way that they actually treated her. She had Liza when she was 24. After that, like MGM were just like, okay, you need to snap back into it straight away. And they forced her to go back into acting immediately, basically. Like obviously she needed money as well. Like money was like a key motivator for her because she wasn't able to survive without it because she was a breadwinner and everyone around her just took her money. The movie Pirates. If you know anything about Judy's life, you know that Pirates is probably like one of the lowest points. It was Jean Kelly's um, like breakthrough role and as much as I adore him <laughs> um, apparently he was a piece of work uh, to work with on many movies there's another person that's been ruined for me she missed famously 99 days of the 135 days of shooting because she was not in the right mental state to be able to handle it she was back on the pills in order to lose the weight again sadly the only break that this woman had had from the age of two and a half was when she had a baby, which is not what I would exactly be calling a break now. And so she was getting these hallucinations as well, whilst on set, because they had to do dances around fires, all sorts of stuff. And she started screaming that they're trying to kill me like she's a Joan of Arc. The pills were obviously having an absolutely terrible effect on her, but she had to take them in order to fit the mold that like the studio wanted her to fit. Because Judy's actually 4 foot 11, so she's a very, very petite little woman. And so according to the studio, any tiny bit of weight gain was definitely noticed by them. Like, I think she gained 20 pounds for, during her pregnancy, and they were like, Hold her hair! Let me just cut off an arm. <laughs> I'm like, I swear, if they could, they would. Now, to me as well, because she'd literally just had Liza, part of me thinks that this could also be postpartum depression. Now of course this is just speculation, this is just me thinking too much about it, but I'm just like, so you've got all of this other stuff, the fact that this was her first baby that she was actually allowed to keep, bullied by a company that is like forcing you to work, I'm just like, okay, I can kind of understand why she'd be dealing with postpartum depression at this time too. Again, none of this was confirmed, I don't think that they even diagnosed it like that back then. She was used to amphetamines, she was literally raised on them, sadly, and so her tolerance to them had actually grown so she had to take more and more to be able to feel the same. And the thing is that she obviously like relied on them. Now, I really want to talk about barbiturates because barbiturates are an absolutely terrible, murderous drug as far as I'm concerned. And barbiturates was absolutely what she was taking because she would take the amphetamines to like hyper up but then she couldn't sleep so you take barbiturates to like help you sleep. They're sedative hypnotics and obviously this was having a huge effect on Judy as it did on other stars that would prescribe them as well. But of course, not only the fact that they're sedative hypnotics, which cause terrible um, hallucinations, all sorts of bad side effects, it's also the fact that their correct dose is incredibly hard to actually pinpoint. Like, you, it's so easy to overdose on this and it causes comas and even death. And sadly, this is the fate of two incredible people, one being Judy, the other one being Marilyn. Um, so it's like, barbiturates are one of the worst uh, prescription drugs that were ever actually given to people as far as I'm concerned. Like we're still dealing with, fent is it fentanyl today? Like that's still a massive issue. Uh, both of their deaths is it was most likely to be accidental. I want to talk about the men in Judy's life now. Judy as we'll be discussing a little bit later, like she desperately needed like to have the help, support, guidance, uh, proper good communication from like, a figure in her life that she couldn't actually create herself and so for Judy in particular she clung to men around her because you know like typically men are meant to be the ones to help a woman out right like that was always a traditional way we need to remember that this is way back in the past <laughs> like she was born in 1922 so like the values back then were quite different to how they are now the things that she would have been taught are very different to what <laughs> she'd get taught now so I want to first talk about uh, one of her dearest friends Mickey Rooney they like I said before they went to school together and he supported her throughout their whole life like watching the first um, Judy Garland show uh, because she went to TV as well if you didn't know um, with Mickey Rooney it was actually really really cute seeing like their like connections still after all of those years because they worked together as teenagers and this is when they were in their 40s and it was just oh it's very very wholesome if you have any time please do check out some of those episodes I'll of course have them linked down below it's like it's really freaking wholesome I want to reiterate that Mickey Rooney and Judy were never actually romantically involved. It was literally a friendship, like a very strong bond, but a very platonic friendship. The studio were like, oh, it's absolutely romantic. Look at these two teenagers in love. And it's like, no, sweetie, not everything has to be about 
Charlie XEX, you know? I need to talk about one of the other most important men in her life that wasn't romantically involved, Louis B. Meyer from MGM. This piece of work, I need to talk about him. He had such a tight grip on Judy, it was incredible that she was even allowed to breathe. Now, if you want to feel enraged, just listen to this part. So, during the 15 years that she worked there, she created a hundred million dollars for them, which is, how much again? 15 billion dollars in today's currency. So, you know, obviously top billing star should be treated with respect, right? Like, amazing, wonderful person. Oh my god, you're like a cash cow. Incredible. Wow, thank you so much for making all of this money for us. No, 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 no. She even went to dinners at their house, like they had her on like the worst chicken broth diet where she was only allowed chicken broth and tea because she was forced to lose weight in like whatever way that they could like make her. So she was silenced all the time, she was given drugs by them, she was constantly told that she was like ugly, that she wasn't good enough, she wasn't acting good enough, that she wasn't making enough money, she wasn't working enough for them anything that they could say to her basically they would um and not only that but they actually fired her for not being you know for not working enough for them when she was like okay that's fine i accept this can i please go to my dressing room and collect the things that are mine not taking anything from the set not taking anything that's not mine at all uh-uh sweetie mm -mm. so she had to leave her possessions in the MGM studio in her dressing room because she wasn't allowed back in. Even like the person, you know, at the, the, the security man at the thing that goes up and down to let you in, he's like, mm, no, you're not on the list. To Judy Garland, $15 billion. No, you can't get your stuff. I would have run that thing down if I was her. Like her restraint? How? <laughs> Oh, and also, there's the fact that despite all of the money that she made for them, she got wrapped up in, like, these absolutely terrible contracts with them, and any money that she did get, like, obviously the men in her life would look after, and then that would get squandered. She didn't know money management or anything like that, and so she got ripped raw deals by everyone around her, so she lived most of her life actually broke. So, thanks, MGM. So let's look at the romance, shall we? If you can even call it that. So, her first marriage. She got married at 19 to a 31 year old. To David Rose in 1941. Now this is actually despite her parents not wanting her to marry him and all this other stuff. Also by this time as well, like, as a teenager, like, her father was found out to actually be gay. Which was not something that was allowed then, and like, he moved away, all sorts of stuff happened with that. So there was that situation with their childhood as well. He was the first man to force her to have an abortion. And then her second marriage to Vincent Minnelli, obviously, in the marriage that she birthed Liza Minnelli, like the amazing person that is Liza. This happened in 1945 when she was 24 and he was 42. Their relationship is actually quite an interesting one. So she met him on the set of Meet Me in St. Louis. Now, that is one of my favorite movies, especially one of my favorite Christmas movies, and I'm gonna be watching it again today because I really need to pick me up. And Judy actually did not want to play this role because she thought it was below her, like, because she wanted to be able to, like, actually work on things that dealt with, like, more character development, all sorts of stuff, and not just be cast as, like, the typical girl next door, which is what kept on happening to her. Guess who was actually a director of that, along with Gigi and along with An American in Paris, both movies which I really enjoy. He could see like this amazing star in her, all sorts of stuff. MGM were like, oh yeah, you should absolutely marry her. You can control her really well. Uh, so yeah, we approve. Go, go do it. Go get married. And so they did. And then they had Liza. She honestly thought that he'd be able to like help her with her like rise to stardom, that he'd be able to lift her up effectively, awkwardly very awkwardly. She actually walked in on him with another man. Now again, being gay was not exactly something that you could be back then, very very sadly. And so obviously like Vincent, like people were like, oh but he's gay, he must be gay because he wears as much makeup as a woman and I will repeat it again, makeup is for everyone. If you want to wear it, please do wear it. I will not judge you, I will just enjoy the fact that you're making art on your face. Um, so anyway, getting back to him, and so when that actually happened, instead of getting into this boiling rage against Vincent and like going to attack him, this was one of the first attempts that she made at suicide. And so she runs into the bathroom, and I believe, was it her neck this time or was it her wrists? Either one, doesn't matter. She had her first attempt at suicide then. 
at least from the reading that I've done, I believe this is the first attempt. The normal reaction is to attack the person, but in this case, because obviously you're the product, you're the one that's making the money for everyone, you're the one that everyone is like relying on, quote unquote, like I think that this is the reason that she actually attacked herself instead of attacking him. Because it's like, if you have no control over anything in your life and nothing that you do to anyone else actually matters, like the only way that you can get back at people is to hurt yourself. At least this is the way that I think that she would have been thinking of it, if that makes sense. That is scary as hell to think of. So that ended in divorce in 1951, kind of understandably. And then she met and married Sid Luft. Um, I think that they actually started from an affair as well. It's not a really good way to start a marriage, but anyway, I think that Sid is one of the few people that she married who genuinely loved her for her. To Judy, like, Sid was actually going to help her in the way that she always wanted Vincent to. Like, he was probably her biggest champion. He was the one that got her the role in A Star Is Born, which I still haven't been able to see. I've only been able to see snippets of because I can't get it in New Zealand. Thank you. Of course, she was famously snubbed for that Oscar because it went to Grace Kelly because she did to not be pretty. Um, so she actually had two children, Sydney, um, who she absolutely adored. She loved all of her children so much, like just seeing that rapport that she has with them. It's always been really, really sweet, even though I still don't agree with the fact that they got put on camera with her. I guess those are like the few memories that you can still keep alive now. So they were married for 13 years. He couldn't cope with the pill taking, suicide attempts, couldn't handle it. And the thing is that Sid actually maintained for his whole life that he never fell out of love with her as well. It's just the fact that he couldn't cope. And also, obviously, we're not the ones in these relationships. We can't really say what was happening behind closed doors all the time and all this other stuff. So it's like, it's their relationship to go through, deal with, suffer through. And it's like, if it was too much, it was just too much. And that's okay sometimes. Sometimes you have to do what's best for you if you can't save everyone around you. And then she married Mark Heron, who again she thought would be able to save her and get her really really good opportunities and who thought, who like, she thought genuinely loved her. That marriage lasted for six months because he was actually gay as well and also abusive. So she was like, nah, I'm not dealing with this, I'm out of here. Fully understandable, Judy. Totally with you. Then her final marriage to Mickey Deans in 1969. Mickey Deans. We don't like him. He was the delivery boy for prescription drugs. And that was how they met. And, and yes, he totally cared about her. He really, really did. Yep. Mm-hmm. All of her friends didn't like him. I can understand why they didn't like him. Like, he didn't really do things that were in Judah's best interest shall we say. He kind of like enabled her rather than wanted to help her. And it's like, okay, great, that's, that's exactly what you're meant to do for someone like Judy that actually needs support and help. Yeah, awesome. Great work there. As far as I'm concerned, I think that he thought that he'd be getting a meal ticket. And so Mickey was actually the one that found her after her overdose. Now, this could have been accidental, could have been on purpose. She'd been on the phone with a friend before and like, <sighs> yeah, that was the last conversation that Judy had had um, with anyone and she'd locked herself in the bathroom. I, I'm, I don't really want to talk about that. I want to focus on her life, thank you very much. So as we can see, men have been an ever-present presence in Judy's life, and not always in like very positive ways, but always in like sort of ways of control, ways of manipulation, ways of some people really genuinely trying to help her and ways of people just blatantly taking advantage of her. And obviously whether this was through business or romance, she always had such a wide gap here. I guess to make her eyes look even bigger. <laughs> so it's like, I can kind of understand why people would fall in love with the idea of Judy Garland. It's like, she was this wonderful, fiery, yet warm and kind and enigmatic and talented and fierce, like, but also fragile person. I can understand why anyone would fall for her and maybe even think that they could save her. But it's like, I think the only man that could have really done that would be Sid, honestly. But the thing about Judy, in every single interview I've seen of her, it's like she never actually lost that hope for love. And I don't think that she ever really lost hope throughout her whole life, which was one of the reasons why we absolutely adored her. And still do. So let's talk about it, shall we? So why is Judy Garland so beloved? Well, you could say it's because she was an incredibly talented singer, dancer, actor, and performer. It's like, but at the same time, everyone kind of had to do all of that stuff back then. But with Judy, it's kind of like she was this underdog performer. Like, she was scrappy. She didn't exactly fit, like, the exact right box that they wanted her to. In her performances, there's, like, this real feel of, like, absolute rawness and emotion and connection and almost like this need for validation and attention like 
all those things that we all feel. I almost feel like the reason, one of the reasons why we all love Judy is because we all are Judy, but none of us could actually be her. Any performance that I've seen of her, it's like she can really be in the moment, feel all of the songs and just so raw, such a connection with everything around her and just get lost in the piece and you can just see it in her face, especially with songs like Old Man River and Over the Rainbow, it's just like you can see that, but then she can just snap back into the performance mode and it's like that is actually a very very rare skill to have and you can say it's down to the fact that she was such a broken person and all of this other stuff it's like I think that she's been kind of like this beacon of hope to so many for the fact that she was openly vulnerable on stage and brutally like witty in the best ways with any interview that I've seen of her as well it's like some of the interviewers can be just kind of like ugh and she still manages to make it an enjoyable experience <laughs> like you just want to keep hearing her talk because the way that she speaks it's not it doesn't just draw you in she wants to always create a connection and that's something that i have definitely noticed with her on stage anytime i see her on stage with people i'm sorry if you can hear the cat scratching in the cat litter oh my god how embarrassing she's always looking to the people that she's working with she's always looking for that searching for a connection with them to say like yes I understand you we're on the same wavelength it's like she's always there for that it's like she doesn't look into the camera very often unless it's like this sort of like knowing smirk or something it's one of those qualities where you're like you can really see that she's clinging to whatever she can and wanting those connections from people sometimes it's reciprocated and the thing is that that is also what makes her a fantastic host because the Judy Garland TV show which only ran for like a year sadly like it was a very extravagant show I'll give it that any guests that she had very tight bond that she was constantly trying to make with them now I would be missing out a huge part of the fandom if I didn't mention the fact of like the fact that she is a gay icon like being a friend of Dorothy has been a code for many many years basically ever since the movie came out as a way to sim signal the fact that you're actually gay um, without you know getting bludgeoned to death sadly um, like I said this was in the times where it was illegal to be gay and there are still people that attack people for being gay like she's such a powerhouse and she always comes back anytime that she has like this setback or this struggle or this harrowing experience like stronger every single time and I think that's one of the reasons that like we root for people like this and people like Britney as well you're just like oh you know like you can almost relate so intensely and you just have like this want for the underdog to actually succeed and I feel like that is absolutely something that's happened with many starlets over the years I've tried the vintage shape to make it a bit more round at the top but my lips aren't quite that right shape was Judy a more successful comeback model than Sinatra? I mean possibly like I think that whilst a lot of us held a lot of admiration for people like Sinatra he still wasn't that great a person um, but with Judy it's like she's a good person and you just know that there is so much fight in her so it's like I feel like that's why we all just really rallied <laughs> behind her I say we all just rallied behind her as if I was alive at that time she was honestly such a charming woman with the best wit and the most amazing storytelling and like I said the connections that she just made and she just wanted to have like this reach out to people all the time it's just such a joy to behold and i'm really really glad that whilst she was absolutely worked to the bone which shouldn't have happened at all i think that like the joy that she gave to so many then and now it's is we're just very lucky to have had her and this is obviously something that she brought on stage obviously like i said before sid left like carnegie hall is like regarded as like one of the best moments in showbiz history like because she just had this presence about her she just commanded a stage and reached out to everyone because it's almost like and again this comes back to the gay community because they could see her struggles and the fact that she wanted this connection there was this constant draw out to the screen well not to the screens out to the other people to connect with and it was just this constant want and it's like i am here with you you're here with me it's like this it's the classic thing about like there's no business like show business you know it's Judy is almost like that trope like 
personified and honestly if you went to one of those shows please do tell me about it down below like i wish that i'd have been alive to be able to see them because i think it would have been one of the most incredible experiences to which you'd be able to have and i'm very jealous of you and again i will reiterate if you've never seen old man river or over the rainbow sung by her in a live format I'll have them linked below like if you want to have like your spine just feel like bleh, like I get goosebumps every single time like not even kidding I've watched so many Judy Garland videos for this and it's like every single time that she sings one of the songs that she really connects with it's like well wow. this is Judah's song this is her ballad which kind of was the ballad for her life in a way that I think that she she went through a time of like wishing that it wasn't but then it kind of becomes of like one of those is life imitating art is art imitating life because whilst all of us can connect with that song it really was judy that had the song kind of like reflect her entire life and struggle <laughs> and in a way like you know how roles um that you play repeatedly can become part of you I feel like with mary kate and ashley constantly being known as who they were um same as like you could even argue about melissa joan hart with sabrina and the teenage witch at least for people like me um and then you also have people like hannah montana miley cyrus followed her forever and even kevin McAllister with macaulay culkin you know like because they played them repeatedly it kind of like framed their entire existence this happened for just playing one role for judy garland like just because she got to play dorothy that chased her forever her whole life and it's like well, she could never get to the rainbow at the same time as never being able to escape the fact that she couldn't get there. And it's almost like I kind of feel like this would have almost been torturous for her for a period of time. Everyone always wants you to sing the song that almost like hurts and mocks you in a way. When you see her sing it and you read the lyrics and you know about her life, you can't separate the song from Judy. She never got away from being that child that wanted to escape, from wanting to be that child that wanted the freedom, from being that child that wanted to be able to have the happiness that she never had. Like, it's quite haunting when you hear the song, <laughs> um, honestly. And of course, like, it was just a performance originally, and it kind of became, like, this never-ending, like, quest. This gumption, this determination was really what got her through so much awfulness not only to do with her own mind but also to do with like everyone around her. that's why i say like this is just judy's song of course we have to mention the fact that judy's fan base was about as vocal <laughs> as britney's fan base is right now judy's fan base it's almost like this is where you're starting to get into like the toxic fan base because people were obsessed with her and it's like i understand like I get it that some of these fans like despite the fact that everyone knew that she was a flawed person that was struggling like struggling um if she wasn't able to perform or if she collapsed on stage she would get booed people would get so viscerally angry with her and it's like um you know that she's this is a person and she did like 13 shows in every week and she was signed off by the doctor for a month but then she was like i have to go back because my fans need me she knew that they needed her as much as she needed them and it's like i don't know if you call it a parasocial relationship i don't know exactly what you call it because it was like this pedestal that they put her on but she kept getting whacked off it all the time because she was a human and she was fallible and flawed i think that now we can kind of reflect on it and be like oh we understand mental health and well-being and fitness like a lot more these days and i'm like yeah we probably shouldn't have done all of that stuff back then should we so with judy like she really did recognize this as well about the fans needing her and the fact that she was kind of born to play this part so a quote from her from an interview i watched it's like she was just born to do that to work to entertain and to take people's mind off their troubles whilst I can, if I can. And it's like, you know, the most damaged people are the ones that want to make everyone else happy. Um, like Robin Williams, for example, is a classic. Like, I think that Judy absolutely fell into that camp because she had dealt with a lot of suffering and she's like, I can actually make other people have a good time. And so that was what she tried to do. And I kind of think that that was what was happening with her. And so I mentioned before about the Judy tapes and I need to talk about them now. So, 
This is the only time, in my opinion, that we really get to hear Judy's voice without being prompted because, like, she's done countless interviews, done all sorts of stuff like that, but that's always us answering the questions that they want the answers to, not talking to us in the way that she wants to talk to us, so to speak. It's like she always gets asked about her weight, about her children. What would you be if you weren't an actress? Oh, tell us about the vaudeville days. And it's like, well, actually, she had other stuff that she wanted to talk about in the Judy tapes, like, Again, have a listen. I will preface this by saying they're very haunting. Um, it's clearly of a woman that has been struggling for a long time and she's a very angry, bitter woman at the same time as just having this want, like I said, for control. It's so visceral. Um, this feeling that you can get from just watching these tapes or listening to them because the thing is that she wanted like people really wanted an autobiography from her and like I've mentioned about the pills and I've mentioned about the fact that she just couldn't cope with stuff so they're like okay cool just record stuff and we'll make it work and so she would just have her in a room sometimes she would sometimes have someone else there and she was just recording her deepest thoughts into this tape gosh it's it's a lot <laughs> it really is a lot so honestly this about wraps literally everything up that i wanted to say about judy like i said this is not going to be a video that's just going through every single step of her life because there's there's literally lists about that so i just wanted to talk about her as a person and i'd be really keen to hear your thoughts on it after listening to all of the things that i've taken from Judah's life. The thing is, like, whilst I've put this under the tragic icons, like, playlist, she never wanted to be seen as, like, someone to pity. She never wanted to be seen as a tragedy. She always wanted to be seen as an inspiration, and that's absolutely what I do see her for. It's like, I feel bad for the things that she went through, but I also admire her for, like, this gumption that she carried, like, for her entire life. Over her lifetime, which is a very short 47 years by the way, her body of work is honestly astounding. So during her career, which technically, as far as I'm concerned, is from the age of two and a half to 47, but technically 13, we'll have to say, she starred in 30 TV shows, gathering a total of 10 Emmy Award nominations, appeared as a guest on nearly 30 other TV shows, fulfilled more than 1,100 theatre, nightclub and concert performances in 18 years from 1951 to 1969. She received a special Antoinette Perry Tony Award for record-breaking 1951 abroad engagements at the Palace Theatre in New York City. Judy recorded nearly 100 singles and over 24 albums. Her radio work encompassed several hundred broadcasts and she sang at countless benefits for the military during World War II. She appeared or starred in 34 feature films. Talk about a body of work that was just never-ending. Honestly, I just wish that she could have had more security, more kindness shown to her, gotten the support that she actually needed in her life as well. Like I said, I'm just going to continue to admire her for the warm, charismatic, witty, wonderful person that she actually was. And probably right now I'm actually just going to go and watch Meet Me in St. Louis because Meet me in St. Louis. I can't believe I said that. Meet me in St. Louis. Is that how you say it? St. Louis? St. Louis? So wrapping this whole thing up, if you did make it all the way to the end, I really, really do appreciate it because I know this has been a very, very long video because her life is just a lot. <laughs> I have so much to say about her. Um, if you made it all the way to the end, I can't have any other emoji but the rainbow one, so please pop down the rainbow emoji. If you want to have the shoes, I will understand. Like, rainbow shoes whichever i hope that you love this have a wonderful wonderful week and i'll see you again next time don't forget to check out those links down below if you want any more information on judy because i think she's an amazing person and there's a lot of misinformation out there so i've really tried to make sure that i've only gone to like very reputable sources for this as well so thank you lovelies so so much and i'll see you again next time bye Making sure you're staying where you're meant to be. It's a kid. Oh, you need a tickle tummy. Okay. Oh, okay. No, no, that was a trap. That was a trap. Okay.